Thank you very much. Uh, as she mentioned, and as you can tell from the logo that you've been staring at for the last 10, 15 minutes, I am indeed on tour. Uh, as she said, on 9-11, I took a flight from Chicago to Boston, Massachusetts, where I drove from Boston to show up there, down through the New England area, upstate New York, dipped down through Pittsburgh, went all through Virginia into Charlotte, switched cars, went to Asheville, North Carolina, drove into Knoxville to Atlanta, flew out to San Antonio, went all up Texas, took another flight from Dallas to San, uh, San Diego, did a couple speeches there, went to Arizona State University, flew up California into San Francisco, did a gig last night in Palo Alto, and here I am. This is show number 23. And I have been... Thank you. I wasn't fishing for applause there, but thank you. I'll take what I can get. Now, all of this traveling of mine was originally supposed to be done with some friends, but they all backed out last second. So in turn, I have been doing all of this driving, all of this flying, traveling all alone. And as you can imagine, all that alone time allows for a lot of thinking time. And somewhere between, I don't know, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and Winchester, Virginia, it hit me that I may have subconsciously, without knowing, planned this entire nationwide tour of mine during the three-year anniversary of a very dark time in my life. And because of the book that she mentioned up front, I'm able to look back every day and see where I was before every single speech three years prior. And three years ago today, I fell asleep to a very dark room. I fell asleep crying to a empty TV monitor in a hospital room in Chicago. But prior to that, I spent the day with my nurses, my mother, and my cousin Natalie being wheeled outside the hospital and doing a block around Chicago. And we did that, unbeknownst to me, because the doctors had just given me seven days left to live. And that was their last, my last wish type of deal. I was able to see and feel the outdoors one more time. Well, to understand how I went from that very, I guess you could call it sad day in Chicago, Illinois, three years ago, to going around the country and on my 31st stop of my motivational speaking tour here in Rochester, Minnesota, we first have to rewind the clock. We have to take it back to the very moment my story began. And that minute's being 8.08 a.m. on April 24th, 1989. Because I came into this world not breathing. I had a heart attack seconds before I was born. Upon completing some tests, the doctors entered the room, pulled my parents aside, and explained to them that I had been born with a congenital heart defect. That congenital heart defect was called hypoplastic left ventricle syndrome, more commonly referred to today as HLHS. At that point, my parents were given two choices. Choice number one, they could take me home, allow Mother Nature to take her course, and in about six days, they would find me passed away silently at my crib. Choice number two, they could put all their faith, all their hope, and all their trust into a team of doctors and into a list called the Oregon Transplant Recipient List. My parents chose the latter, and within a matter of 12 hours, I was airlifted by helicopter to a hospital in Chicago, Illinois. There, I landed on the roof of a doctor by the name of Dr. Idris. Now, Dr. Idris was a German pediatric cardiac surgeon who had spent the last 10 years of his life practicing infant heart transplantation on the hearts of puppies and kittens. It was Dr. Idris who pulled my parents aside for the second time in 24 hours to tell them that they were only going to give me 21 days to live on life support. The reason being was that the night of the 21st day, all of my other organs would begin to fail and shut down like dominoes, one after another. And nobody wanted me to experience any more pain. So my parents consented, and they waited, and they watched as day one went by. Two, three, four, seven, nine, twelve, and all this time, couples were entering and exiting the sliding glass doors. Couples like I see in the room right now. Well, 17, 18, 19, the 21st day had come. The doctors were getting ready to pull the plug, but that was when the phone rang, with a donor offer from Ontario, Canada. That night, a leader jet embarked on a journey to Canada to save my life, and on May 16, 1989, I became the fourth infant heart transplant ever performed in the Midwest, and the eighth in the nation. Well, years passed, and I never had any complications. That is, until June 8, 2009, 
When I looked down to find that my ankle was swollen, it was three times its natural size. I had no idea what was going on at the time. I had no idea that the swollen ankle was the tall tale sign of heart failure. So I moseyed into my parents' room, showed my mom, and she saw it and she knew what it was. So she freaked out, completely panicked, grabbed me, rushed me to my room, threw me on my bed, grabbed a stack of pillows, put them at the foot of my bed, and then she asked me to elevate my feet. Her hope was that by some form of gravity, all of that swelling and all that water retention would somehow find its way back down into my body and I would naturally excrete it. That didn't happen. Her theory proved to be a complete and utter bust. Well, an hour later, that swelling had found its way up to my knee and it was capsizing the entire joint. My parents helped me hobble to the family car and later into the community hospital that I was born in. There I underwent a series of EKGs, echocardiograms, chest x-rays, until finally the doctor came back in the room and he had this look on his face that I honestly have never seen before on a human and I haven't seen it since. It was this face that was mixed of terror and sorrow at the same time. And he just simply turned to my parents and said, your son is in heart failure. I later spent the rest of summer 2009 in and out of hospitals until I was finally correctly diagnosed with transplant vasculopathy. And for those of you who do not know in this room, transplant vasculopathy is a phenomenon in which the transplanted organ seemingly ages decades overnight. In my case, by the time the first infant heart was removed and the second heart was put in, the surgeon doing the procedure later told me and my family that my initial heart had looked like an 80 year old that was filled with cement. He was amazed that I was breathing by myself and on my own when I was wheeled into the OR. Well, of course, on the day that I found out that I was diagnosed with transplant vasculopathy was the same day that I found out I needed that second heart transplant to live. But to throw the cherry on top, thanks to 20 years of ingesting anti-rejection medications coupled with months prior of undiagnosed heart failure, aka a lack of blood perfusion from the heart, meaning blood pumping to other parts of the body, in my case, the kidney, I was also an end-stage renal failure. So not only did I need a second heart transplant to live, I needed my first kidney transplant as well. So I waited. I later spent 70 days in the intensive care unit of that Chicago hospital awaiting the gift of life. And then finally, on October 21st, 2009, thanks to a family who stepped outside of themselves during the darkest moment of their lives to save mine, I received my heart. My kidney transplant followed 24 hours later. But this brings me to why I am here today. Upon diagnosis of transplant vasculopathy, I panicked. I completely freaked out. I was having all these thoughts in my head, thoughts about my own mortality, my past, and my future aspirations that I may never fully achieve. And in that moment, I needed something to vent to. So I grabbed a piece of paper and a pen, and I started journaling. And it felt really good when I was done, so I started doing it every single day. And every single one of these journals, I made sure to put all my emotions into. And after about two weeks of doing so, the light bulb went off in my mind, and I realized that if I were to journal every single day, I could potentially help others out there. Because these thoughts that I was having, these thoughts about my own mortality, about my past, about my future, could not possibly be thoughts that only I was experiencing. There had to be hundreds, if not thousands out there who were feeling the exact same thing. So on that day that I realized that, I vowed to journal every day. And I did so, and I'm pleased to say that a year and a half after my first journal, I later took those entries, compiled them as short stories, into a book entitled Swim, A Memoir of Survival. Now, I tell you all that not for a cheap plug. I swear to you, I'm not doing that for a cheap plug, right? Even though the book is available on Amazon.com, it's going to be fun. I don't know about that. I'm telling you all of this because at the end of the book, I close the book with two different things. The first is a page that simply reads, if you are out there and you are sick and you have nobody to talk to and nobody around you understands and you just want to vent, reach out to me. Here's my website. Here's a link. This is how you get to a contact form. Shoot me a message. Let's chit chat. I then close it with a series of rules. They are a list of rules that I wish I knew and had with me when I was going headfirst into heart failure. They are rules that I think anybody, regardless of their situation, if it's organ failure or leukemia, needs to know when they're heading into their journey. 
I wrote all of these rules for these people and I wrote them for the ill. And I was sitting there with all 270 pages and I had the, the little computer screen in front of me and a little button for Amazon. I clicked it and I published it and it went out into the world. And I just basically crossed my fingers and hoped for the best. I hope that at least somebody out there, maybe in Minnesota, maybe Wisconsin, maybe even in California, would somehow write me and it would help one person. Well, about a month and a half after I clicked that button, I started getting letters. First from this area, place where I'm from, Chicago, Milwaukee, Indianapolis. But a month and a half later, letters started trickling into the coast. I started getting letters from New York, California, Texas, Florida. But a month and a half after that point, letters started coming in from the Philippines, South Africa, Ireland, the entire United Kingdom. And what I quickly found out was that the people who were actually adding my book to cart and pressing purchase on Amazon were not the people who I wrote the book for. They were not the ill. Sure, I was getting those, la those letters from them inevitably, but what I found out was that the people who were purchasing it were the caretakers. They were purchasing it and handing it to their loved one later after they had finished the book and had their way with it. And what I quickly found out by emailing all of these mothers, sisters, girlfriends, brothers, was that those rules perfectly applied and perfectly related to the caretaker's experience. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, rule number one. 